adolescents towards healthier food choices. Nudge is defined as a subtle environment change in a food distribution setting designed to make a healthy choice as an easy choice. So this is an area of growing interest within public health nutrition, uh, which is a food choice architecture, how a food choice is framed and its influence on subsequent food selection. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. G. Banuprakash Reddy, who is uh, representing our director today. Uh, sir is scientist G and he heads the Department of Biochemistry. His research focuses on molecular nutrition of age-related disorders, diabetes, obesity, and other chronic non-communicable diseases. Dr. Reddy is a holder of multiple prestigious fellowships, including Fellow International Un Union of Nutritional Sciences 2022, National Academy of Medical Sciences 2020 Fellow, Royal Society of Chemistry, London, 2019. Sir has authored more than 250 peer-reviewed scientific papers, book chapters, and regulatory reports. I welcome you, sir, to give us the opening remarks and the welcome address. Thank you, Kiran Mai, for that uh, kind introduction. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, rather good evening to one and all. I am here on behalf of my director, Dr. Hemlata. As Dr. Subarao said, uh, the director is on some other uh, agency meetings he has to attend. So I am representing, representing her to welcome you all to this e-dialogue series on Let's Fix Our Food. I'm sure many of you are aware of the importance of this program and also to some extent the background of this program. But for the benefit of those who have joined newly or those who are not fully aware of this program, let me say a few words about this program. Uh, but before do that, let me say something that, you know, the, the background of this, this whole exercise, that uh, malnutrition has got two ends. And uh, we all know the, the, uh, the, the well-known end that is undernutrition. And uh, over the decades, we have been struggling. We have been working very hard to overcome this problem. And we have made significant uh, achievements, uh, significant uh, success, and a uh, lot of progress has been made. While traveling this journey, we have encountered the other side of the challenge, the other side of the malnutrition that is poor nutrition. Uh, at least uh, 30 years ago or so, we would not have thought or imagined that we have to really wage a war for this side of the problem of the malnutrition. But today it's a reality. So uh, basically, the overnutrition, uh, not going into the details of the overnutrition, the direct manifestation is overweight and uh, obesity. And of course, overweight and obesity has got multiple factors or multiple etiological aspects. But one direct uh, thing is connected to the food, or in other words, the calories that we consume, how much we consume and how much we spend. I think that's a, that's a issue. And what is important is that you know the, the overweight or obesity is uh, you know significantly affecting the children and adolescents, and this is very worrisome. I, the reason is that you know unless otherwise it has been controlled, it has been managed properly. This has got long-lasting, rather it has got an impact for the rest of the life, uh, particularly in terms of non-communicable diseases. I'm not going to name those. Uh, we have many many health problems associated with overweight and obesity. So, uh, as I said, among many other factors, it's, it's the consumption of calories directly linked to the food choices, the food environment, the food accessibility. I think the whole uh, exercise of this let us fix our food is about the food environment. When we say food environment, it has got multi components, the food supply chain, the availability, the accessibility, the taste, and then you know the marketing uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And more so our kids, particularly children and adolescents, how much of 
you know, these factors and this environment they have exposed what is the influence that they have got is a, is the issue and in this background uh, and you know, the, the whole of this food environment the one important factor is high fat high salt high sugar component that's what they are calling it hfss so in this background uh, indian council of medical research institute that is icmr nin along with all the uh, you know, uh, other partners here like unicef public health foundation of india world food program and uh, institute of uh, uh, economic growth and uh, many many other stakeholders here are as a, as the consortia partners have decided to initiate this program to come up with a framework or rather you know make a policy at the end of this series uh, that i think that will help the administrators or policy makers to to decide how to tackle this problem i think in this background the series of you know this series uh, uh, started and very aptly i think the first of its uh, series started in on the last year on world obesity day on march 4th now it is the seventh one there are many many themes on on uh, this uh, series uh, as you all know that uh, uh, i'm not going to read all about it one is the advertisement and marketing aspects of uh, uh, the food the food environment or the food products the second one is taxing and taxation or taxing policies uh, as well as you know uh, other one is about uh, no making availability or non availability of unhealthy foods or making availability of the healthy foods in the environment that we live or particularly the children and adults uh, for the our you know discussion point today and so on so forth there are you know, every series has got its own theme so in this context today's theme is on the role of nudges and the choice architecture uh, how 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 we can actually develop to help the right choices the environment of the food etc and etc i think here one of the, the many many things but uh, most important things are taste to my knowledge and portion size and also the calorie consumption awareness i think that, that is one important aspects i believe and also the healthier or nutritional aspects of the food and all in all you know it comes down or boils down to the aspect of nutrition education how much we educate our uh, children and adolescents the reason i think the focus is on adolescents is that adolescents have a unique requirements of nutrients whether it's macronutrients or micronutrients not only the requirements but their their choice and taste is also is also different because there is a transition from childhood to adulthood and this is the period you know it has got lot of impact on developing their food choices and healthy food choice behaviors and so on and so forth and that is influenced by many many factors uh, that's that's the whole uh, i think theme of the today's uh, uh, focus and today's talk Uh, where how how we educate them how they get influenced by these factors let's say what are the you know marketing strategies most of the advertisements focus this particular group and how are they get influenced how do we overcome that and which of these you know food outlets whether it's you know in in a school or college canteen or is it a cafeteria or is it a restaurant or is it a street food No, and, and many many other places in addition to the food that we make at home or you know when you go to grocery shop what all the things that are available there and how much you know the knowledge that they utilize that is available on the labeling and right now dr subara and his team is working very hard to come up with the print of fact labeling and how do we make it much more robust and which is more practical so these are the issues that i think the series particularly today's uh, theme is is focused and uh, and most important thing is the everyone is involved here and uh, i don't know how many of you are aware the india food regulator that is fssa has started a program eat right program in the eat right program they want whole of society to participate here whole of society means all the stakeholders like you know civil societies government bodies regulators and all the citizens so also here i think i see in addition to the eminent speakers dr rosarena and uh, dr oliver 
We also have rightly the panelists uh, who represent, I think, uh, from the uh, hotel and restaurant uh, sector, that is uh, Mr. Achay Nilakantam. And we also have somebody from the food delivery startup, rightly, uh, Priyank Jain, Mr. Priyank Jain. We have a chef, very interestingly, uh, Mr. Inam. And more importantly, we have Pratik Vaidya representing, representing the youth perspective. I, I think that that's the focus of uh, this theme. And I hope he will help us to, to help them how we can you know, uh, get to the right food choice. And most importantly, what are the uh, nudging strategies that this group can develop? And then finally, you know, provide a draft to the administrators. And uh, at the end, I think we will have a useful document and uh, that would have a long lasting impact and implication for our health and nutritional food. Uh, once again, thank you all. And uh, I once again, thank the resource persons, be it the panelists or uh, the speakers for their uh, sparing their valuable time and efforts. And I'm, I'm sure you all are going to have a wonderful session in the next 30, 40 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Subha, and thank you all. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bhana Prakash, for that uh, quick sum up and welcome of uh, uh, welcome address on behalf of the head of the institute and uh, on your own behalf. And then thank you for making those very pertinent points about the growing overweight obesity and uh, the concern among children and how choice architecture is very important. I think. Uh, Without much ado, I'll straight away go to the background and opening remarks. Um, uh, I think my team is ready with a slide to show who I am. I, I don't uh, uh, think that is required because I've been communicating with all the panelists through them and uh, through our email. Uh, we'll, I'll directly share the slide, but before I share my slides about the Let's Fix Our Food program, I thank, I thank Dr. Bhanu for actually uh, giving us an overview of what the initiative also does. Uh, and before that, I have few administrative announcements. We welcome all the attendees who are online, both on YouTube as well as uh, on Zoom platform in the webinar. Uh, your questions are most welcome, but we request that you post your questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. And those questions, if they are targeted at any of the panelists or any of the speakers, you may indicate that clearly in your Q and A, uh, and then we will take up uh, as the uh, you know as we move along. And all the questions to the speakers will be asked at the end of their presentations, and uh, the panelists, uh, the panel discussion will be moderated. And then once the uh, once one or two rounds of questions are over with them, we'll take up the audience questions to them. So this is how the entire uh, uh, you know scheme of affairs uh, runs in today's uh, e-dialogue. Uh, and meanwhile, um, I'll just uh, share my slides to give an overview of uh, what uh, this initiative is all about. And uh, and and uh, Dr. Bhanu had actually made my job very easy. But uh, to just give you uh, to for those who have not. Uh, been part of the earlier six e-dialogues that we've run, and those who are joining us for the first time, it would be good for you to know that Let's Fix Our Food initiative uh, is uh, the e-dialogue series is spearheaded by the National Institute of Nutrition, but supported by UNICEF India. And we have many uh, partners in this consortium. This Let's Fix Our Food is a consortium of like-minded organizations whose only idea is to, uh, you can see all the logos uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide, the Global Health Advocacy Incubator, Deakin University of Australia, Institute of Economic Growth. Then you have Public Health Foundation of India, very important partner, World Food Program, UI Initiative, World Health Organization. We have International Food Policy Research Institute. We have Resolve to Save Lives and many other organizations joining hands with us. The very aim of this particular initiative is to advance young people's right to healthy foods and healthy food environment. In the changing scenario, we all realize that the adolescents and the children have their own right in deciding food environment. But unfortunately, so now, um, the food environment is mostly beyond the control of the children and adolescents. And uh, they don't even know that their uh, food environment is being manipulated by many forces. 
uh, in this particular initiative, what we want to do is we want to get the views and lived experiences of the adolescents to the center tables of discussion. And we think their points of view, along with all the other stakeholders' points of view, are very important in shaping the food environment to make their food choices healthy. Thus, we can expect to have a better future and a healthier and nourished future for India. So in this endeavor, uh, initially, uh, some of the partners have joined hands and then with Niti Aayog, they've had a very important meeting in 2021, wherein quick policy actions to meet this. I mean, this slide tells you about the growing rates of obesity, how uh, you know the uh, adolescents uh, don't get to do outdoor activities, especially the girls, how the fruit and vegetable consumption is very, very low. And these are some of the issues why we have increasing overweight and obesity and also the way food is available, accessible, and the, 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 the kind of food that is made affordable, especially, sometimes it so happens that the unhealthy food is more affordable than the uh, healthier option. So all these uh, influence their use and choice of foods. And then to, uh, uh, to actually look at uh, uh, the food environment and then modify this food environment, five key policy actions were uh, identified. One is to look at uh, how to regulate the private and public media advertising of high fat, sugar and salt foods to adolescents. And then what's the extent of nutrition literacy of the adolescents and then how it impacts their food choices and push for front of pack nutrition labeling, which at a glance gives you an overview of the nutritional quality of the food. And is there a possibility to tax uh, unhealthy foods or double duty actions? And these are some of the uh, initiatives that were thought of. Uh, we've uh, run a series of e-dialogues on each of these topics and uh, uh, the ones that are related to regulating private and public media advertising on HFSS and, uh, and uh, nutrition literacy demanded two or three e-dialogues, I mean two, two e-dialogues e each. And then we were, um, we had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, food for thought in those uh, e-dialogues and then we are sure we are going to come up with uh, a number of policy recommendations. We are soon as a consortium with all the members planning uh, to uh, have an interface and then have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Niti Aayog to uh, discuss the findings and the, and the policy initiatives that can be suggested in this particular scenario. So uh, in this, we um, are trying to generate a, a nationwide representative information of capturing the adolescents' voices at the same time, what nudges their choices. Uh, the Public Health Foundation of India, which is also an important partner in this particular consortium, has uh, conducted, has peer-reviewed a study um, with, uh, a, you know, a, a lakh and a half adolescents from around the country. In 12 languages, a survey was conducted to find out what are the nudges uh, that prompt food choices. And uh, in this initiative, there are policy actions, there is adolescent engagement. This is uh, an important part of adolescent engagement where we have them as panelists and discuss their point of view at the same time, knowing about adolescents. And then also this consortium has actually, uh, 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 has come up with a, a group of 50 to 100 young adolescents, motivated adolescents as youth leaders who take forward uh, the objective of this initiative of uh, you know uh, 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 making their peers aware of the food environment and importance of healthy food choices. So in this initiative, if uh, some of us are members, the others are advisors, uh, there are knowledge partners, uh, there, are, uh, there are people uh, uh, who implement implementation partners. There are several of us in this initiative. The only important uh, thing that as part of this initiative we want to do is we, we want to have uh, you know, uh, uniformity in our points of view despite where we come from, whether we are researchers, whether we are policymakers, whether we are regulators, academics or parents or industry or anyone, we need to have unison in our voice when we talk to the policymaker. That's what we uh, think and that's what this initiative is all about. And we see the, the, the choice architecture of adolescents is uh, affected in, you know, at school, at home, at community uh, and on digital media. There are a number of appeals that, uh, you know, uh, these uh, different uh, vendors or the food manufacturers and others use to actually influence their food choice. Uh, in this particular uh, uh, webinar or e-dialogue, we want to talk about the role of nudges and especially the choice architecture, especially which means uh, 
the way food is framed, the way food is displayed, the way food is primed also is very important. Once, for instance, one goes to a restaurant and the kind of food that is prominently displayed or prominently uh, made to show, uh, prominently uh, you know, uh, pictured and put all around the restaurant, um, perhaps gets ch chosen better. Uh, similarly, is there a possibility that uh, the children who are adolescents who are exposed to different kinds of foods uh, can uh, simple nudges like this or priming healthy food at uh, uh, school canteens, restaurants, uh, and also uh, the coffee shops, wherever they go, and supermarkets, wherever they visit. If the healthy foods are displayed prominently, if the choice architecture is altered, if a better choice is made available, uh, could it be useful in terms of uh, shifting their food choices? Of course, we we'll learn from two of our very erudite speakers who have researched in this area uh, uh, in the subsequent session. So this is one of the um, you know ideas. Uh, it emanates from one of our uh, uh, you know what what do I say review of literature and uh, an opinion article that we've published in the EJC and recently, wherein we've seen, as you know, the uh, you know very very impressive pictures of the food with the kind of foxonomy and hashtags that get shared do have an impact on social media and other media do have an impact. Uh, in terms of shaping food choices, what we call as food porn. Food porn ha does have some important, uh, uh, it plays an important part of the food architecture. In this article, we've argued and we've, we've raised the question whether food porn, which is often uh, related to unhealthy food choices, using the same mechanisms of psychological, physiological, and psychosocial impacts that it can bear on uh, an adolescent's mind, can it be used for promoting healthy food choice in the sense that the way an unhealthy food is pictured and made glamorous, if a healthy food is also made pictured and glamorous and prominently displayed in, a, in, in the area where the children, whether it is a digital domain, whether it is a physical restaurant, whether it is a school canteen, whether it is at home, uh, if the food is also made equally appealing, uh, healthy food, can it have a similar impact of a choice, prompting a choice of that food. And, uh, uh, you know, these are some of the issues that we will discuss uh, over the uh, next one hour or so in this particular uh, e-dialogue. And I welcome all uh, the speakers and the panelists and many of our attendees who are attending on both uh, the Zoom platform as well as uh, uh, YouTube today. And uh, we'll have, I'm sure, we, I'm excited to listen to uh, two of our uh, speakers who have in fact worked and one of them has worked in the academy and now in the industry trying to put forth uh, this kind of uh, you know choice architecture made available on digital platforms this is a uh, very very interesting mix of uh, you know people who are trying to bring in uh, uh, healthy food options uh, as chefs and uh, as hoteliers and we also have a young uh, you know participant joining us and we are very eager to listen to his points of view. He, I am sure, represents the uh, millions of adolescents that we've got in this country for whom this program is being done. And I thank you one and all. And then now I'll request my colleague, uh, Dr. Nida, to introduce our uh, speaker. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Nida Hazari. I'm a project scientist here. And uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Junofai Rosarina. Uh, she is a behavioral scientist at Swiggy and the founder and CEO of India Behavioral Economics Network. She is a researcher, public speaker, and consultant for providing behavioral science training and consultancy. She has worked with several prominent organizations, including Google, Migros, UNICEF, and UNDP. She has even published three books and over 35 research papers to her credit. And she's going to talk about role of nudges and choice architecture in guiding adolescents towards healthier food choices. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Great. Um, can you see my screen? Awesome. Yeah. Great. So, um, Great. So today I'm going to be talking about how we could use behavioral science to sort of nudge adolescents towards making healthier food choices. By 
discussing few points which are largely more relevant for adolescents that drives the way they make food choices right so these are few factors that plays a huge role one of it is social factors social factors become super relevant when it's adolescence a lot of peer influence happens Uh, Dr. Junofi, there is some issue with your audio. I'm sorry. Social but, uh, norms a lot more. Dr. Junofi, uh, there's some audio issue uh, with. Medical loss, lots of. Uh, lessons are more critical. Uh, Dr. Junofi, we can't hear you. There is some issue, audio issue on your end. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perhaps it might help if you turn off your video for a while and let the, you know, yeah, please. Great. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me again. But yeah, so as I was saying, there are a bunch of factors that influence adolescents, sometimes disproportionately higher. And one of it is social. So peer pressure, social norms have been proven to act way more effectively with uh, adolescents than you know older adults. And again, adolescents are more prone to what we call system one decisions, which are more impulsive decisions that are not really thought through. And also, with I mean, we already discussed a little bit about how influencers and social media have a huge effect. But um, all of this falls into creating a lot of eating disorders among adolescents and that's an area we want to talk about as well and fourthly economic reasons become a lot more relevant adolescents have extremely high price elasticity mostly due to less amount of money that they have um, in the hand all right so um i want to just walk us quickly through these four factors and then we'll talk about what can be done to deal with this firstly social pressure all of my friends eat burgers for lunch, so I do too. This is like super, super common among adolescents. Right? We do try to mimic what other friends are doing, what influencers are doing, what the cool kids at school are doing. So adolescents tend to mimic a lot more. And this can be used for bad, but also this can be used for good, right? So when they're pure, are working out more often, eating healthier food, these other adolescents also tend to do that. So that could be a good thing as well. Secondly, cognitive. This ice cream is amazing, so I'm going to have two more. So as we grow older, we start thinking a lot more about consequences of, you know, hey, uh, if I keep doing this, I'm going to gain weight and all of that. And these impulsive decisions are a lot more common among um, adolescents. And um, studies have shown how adolescents fall a lot more to instant gratification and also have significantly lower self-control when it comes to a lot of various different factors across life. And thirdly, eating disorders, and it's surprisingly common among uh, adolescents. And this involves binge eating, but also other eating disorders, but we'll focus a little bit more on binge eating today. Okay, fourthly, uh, because of the high price elasticity, often they prioritize the price over nutritional value and over uh, hygiene and so on, which also leads to a lot of other issues that uh, we'll talk about in just a bit. Okay, so the, we spoke about four different factors. We'll also see what can be done to help these adolescents make healthier food choices. So I just picked five, which have already been proven to work really, really well. Uh, first is visual hierarchy. Um, visual hierarchy basically means, we already spoke about this a little bit in the intro, but it just means placing food in a way that it's very salient, healthier food in a way that it's salient, and you just naturally end up picking it. So for instance, there's a lot of re research that shows that whatever is on your eye level, you end up picking it a lot more often. So whichever is more visible to you, which is why in a lot of supermarkets, um, at the eye level of children, they put, you know, kids chocolates and toys and all of that to, you know, sell stuff to their consumers, not the customer, but to the consumer directly, right? And the same thing happens for adolescents as well. And in fact, in a lot of school cafeterias and uh, um, other stalls inside the schools, a lot of behavioral scientists have worked on designing the store in a way that 
kids naturally pick healthier food options without forcing them or using any other method. Also making it a little more easy to access, of course, helps as well. Secondly, defaults. So what is the default food at your school? What is the default food at your home, right? And this is very important. So is eating pizza or burger for lunch a cheat day or is that the default? And it really matters, right? So if it is the default, then you end up eating a lot more of that. However, when it is not, you eat much less of this. And it also, social norms, again, play a huge role of whatever is prevalent in your society. So for instance, typically in India, uh, a lot of, let's say pizza or burger is seen as a negative food. Of, it's a fast food. You don't really eat it. Uh, parents are typically not really in favor of eating that. Um, but on the other hand, people are okay to eat just rice and not necessarily a lot of vegetables in some households, right? So if that's the social norm and that's the default, you end up following that a lot more again. So that's, that's something for us to look into. Thirdly is portion sizes. Again, this was also covered in the intro. I really strongly feel that there's going to be a lot of overlap between the talks and the panels, but that's a good thing, right? It just says that all the points are valid and it's going in the right direction. So with respect to portion sizes, there's this really cool research on how when you use a larger plate, you end up, end up eating a lot more. This includes in buffets uh, where you serve your own portion of food as well. So this is a very non-conscious thing. So what if we just swap larger plates for smaller plates or we place larger plates next to vegetables for you to take servings of vegetables, larger bowls there, smaller bowls next to rice for you to take portions of rice. So you can technically use what we call choice architecture or designing behaviorally to naturally make people eat in a more healthy way, right? Also, there's studies that show that when you open a larger pack of chips, you end up eating a lot more chips versus a smaller pack. So you don't open two packs when you eat a smaller pack, right? So you can use such small things to also um improve the way adolescents eat fourthly social norms social norms are very 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 powerful and we spoke about this already um but we actually tested this out in a couple of schools in switzerland where we created posters that sort of helped build perception um that says that eating healthy is cool like eating healthy is beneficial and eating healthy is what all the kids are doing so we um, ran various different studies you know, various different interventions, one around eating a lot more fruits and how it makes your skin glow and look, you look nicer and all of that. So, you know, bunch of different things that just says that, hey, everyone out there is doing this and also role models of, you know, saying something like this particular actor, actor or actress eats X, Y, Z, drinks eight glasses of water every day. All of that also plays a huge role. And lastly, we'll also sorry, give me a second. Yeah, we'll talk about food labeling. Again, this was also covered in the intro. Um, but food labeling is basically just creating very clear and consumable nutritional information. So clear is very evident for us. We know what that means. What is consumable? So when you say something is, let's say 300 calories, what does that mean? It doesn't mean something to a lot of us, right? So it doesn't naturally convert into something tangible in our head. Look at this image on the top, right? So it's a Snicker chocolate bar uh, is 229 calories. That means nothing to us. But when you say something like, hey, to burn this 229 calories, you need to walk for 42 minutes or run for 22 minutes. When you say that, that makes me think twice, right? Hey, <laughs> Is this even worth it? Like, do I want to walk for 42 minutes to just burn this one tiny chocolate? Maybe not, right? So making it a lot more consumable is also very important. And again, um, there's been a lot of effort towards this, but creating color-coded labels, symbols, graphics that are very, very evident and clearly conveys the nutritional information, the health value, and all of that is extremely effective as well. So yeah, the quick run through of what we covered. So we saw how adolescents make food choices across various spectrums. We spoke about social, cognitive, psychological, economic factors. Then we also saw a couple of interventions that have been proven across various different cultures and contexts to work really well uh, in terms of promoting healthier choices. 
that's it from me. Um, if anyone have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, uh, we can uh, allow a few questions from the co-panelists and uh, the others on the panel. Uh, if you have any quick questions or else, uh, if any of the audience has questions, please post them in the chat box or in the Q&A. So before that, uh, I mean, uh, if uh, Dr. Judah, if, you may, if I may ask one question about, you've been with uh, you know, Swiggy for a while. Yeah. And uh, we see that many of these uh, uh, digital food ordering platforms do provide an option for healthy food. What's been the uh, outcome of that? I mean, is it nudging people uh, towards uh, healthy food options? Both, I mean, you may have done some consumer research and surveys about that and then how it has been used and the numbers are increasing or decreasing. If so, in what age group? Right. right. So um, one thing that we weren't doing earlier, which we are trying to do now is, okay, so Swiggy has always had this tab of guilt-free, which is specifically healthier food options. So every, you know, for instance, eating whole meat and whole wheat instead of uh, maida, uh, it has sugar-free juices and so on. Um, one thing that we weren't doing earlier was targeting it. So for instance, when someone clicks on, let's say, a guilt-free tab, they could either be someone who's trying to lose weight. It could be an older person who's trying to eat a lot more fiber. It could be um, someone who's going to the gym regularly and needs more protein. All of them still go to this healthy tab. So it's one thing, but the kind of people who enter these things are very, very different, right? So we are now targeting it. So I assume that the numbers would get even higher, but we already see uh, quite a lot of growth in the number of people who actually, you know, click on this guilt-free tab, which is showing the intent that, hey, I want to eat healthy. So that is definitely happening. We unfortunately don't have the age breakdown at Spiggy. So can't really comment if it's adolescents doing that, if it's older people, but we do see that there is a trend uh, towards healthier eating now. Imagining you extrapolate this particular option, uh, exercising this particular option to non-digital but uh, real-life platforms like restaurants or maybe, uh, you know, coffee clubs and things like that. Uh, do you really see uh, an option that, you know, especially the way uh, they are displayed, you said, the way the food is primed, you said, the way they are, uh, the, the, the visual hierarchy is maintained. But are there any Indian studies to show that, you know, these have been working better in stores? Um, so okay, I'm, I'm going to keep my video off. Um, cool. So I worked with a restaurant at one point where we introduced um, tags that said, hey, this one is healthier. And we also created a specific menu saying these are, this is like the healthier menu. And um that was like the only study that I've been involved with. I haven't exactly gone through the research in this particular area. But there, for instance, when we had a separate menu for healthy, healthier options, that worked really bad. However, when we incorporated a tag saying this one is healthier within the main menu, that kind of worked really well. So um, the visual hierarchy of tagging something and making it a little more salient within the pre-existing menu works well. Um, the hypothesis or the hunch that the owner had for this was that people were probably a little shy to ask for the healthier menu, despite them mentioning it everywhere that we also have this healthier menu. So it's possible that when you just have it as part of the normal menu, people order it more. But um, yeah, that, that was interesting to me. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions at this point. Uh, we will move to our next speaker, but we request you to please... Uh, uh, stay connected so that there are any questions at the end of it, uh, they'll, be, they'll be put to you. Sure, yeah. yeah. May I request my colleague, um, Ms. Kiran Mai, to introduce our next speaker? It's my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Dr. Mariel. She is a lecturer of psychology in Birmingham City School of Social Sciences. 
Dr. Mariel is a social and health psychologist with research expertise in assessing the personality correlates of dangerous patterns of food and drug consumption behavior. Her areas of expertise include disordered eating behavior, childhood eating behavior. She even has extensive research exposure on developing behavioral nudge interventions to promote fruit and vegetable selection and consumption in primary schools at lunchtime. Dr. Mariel uh, chooses to be an academician so that her work might improve childhood eating behavior and impact subsequent adult health. I request Dr. Mariel to share her valuable views on the global perspective on uh, nudges and choice architecture to adolescent food choices. Over to you, Dr. Thank you very much. I'll just um, I'll just share my slides now. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction um, and to the speakers so far. Um, as um, as has been mentioned, there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, in what we've discussed so far. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try um, and skim over where there's quite considerable overlap um, and focus more on the differences. Um, but yes, yeah, so I am Maria Marcano Olivier. Um, I um, research in childhood eating behaviour with a focus on choice architecture interventions using behavioural nudges. So to focus on why this is um, important, uh, research has shown that uh, children in developed countries um, uh, consume excess calories uh, relative to their recommended daily amount. These calories tend to come from uh, high fat, sugar and salt foods. Um, and so what we do quite often end up seeing is um, an over consumption of food, so an over uh, nourish, uh, but actually without the micro and macronutrients uh, that are really required for a, for a healthy life and lifestyle. Um, so whilst over consuming, we see children under consume um, in micronutrients such as iron, um, iodine and folate. Uh, now these do have significant health impacts um, at child, in childhood, uh, but also we know that children's eating behaviour does tend to track into adulthood. Uh, so a child with healthy eating patterns is more likely to become an adult with healthy eating patterns, and a child with poor eating habits is unlikely to change those in adulthood. So we can expect to see children who overconsume calories but underconsume micronutrients to develop obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and bone and joint problems associated with overweight. We also see them experiencing fatigue um, and poor immune function um, and stunted growth if they have an iron deficiency, uh, so perhaps lacking in those dark green leafy vegetables. Um, inadequate thyroid function, uh, which can even result in atypical neurological development and again poor growth. Um, and also cognition, social development and um, well-being deficiencies um, or reductions compared to what we might want to see um, in our children with a folate deficiency. So we can see that with this underconsumption of micronutrients, uh, we can expect children to have um, stunted or atypical growth um, and a whole host of potential health impacts into adulthood uh, associated with those lack of micronutrients. So the justification for considering um, nudges as opposed to other more intensive um, healthy eating interventions or to component interventions um, is that multi-component interventions do tend to be very expensive. Um, and as a result of that, um, government uh, agencies, those who are providing support for these interventions, uh, don't tend to want to fund interventions that uh, require, for example, um, 
specialist implementation um, or in some cases rewards um, for eating healthy, tangible rewards, those who require um, funding. Um, so instead, we turn to behavioural nudges. Um, we've seen alternative uh, eating programmes um, that are uh, information-based interventions, such as in the UK, we have the Change for Life campaign. The Change for Life campaign gives information to children, parents and schools about healthy swaps from unhealthy food items to healthy food items um, and ways that you can exercise to, um, to uh, moderate your, um, your calorie uh, consumption and subsequent uh, fat deposits around the body. However, research has consistently shown, not just in the UK with the Change for Life campaign, um, but globally and indeed not just in eating, in all health behaviours, uh, that simply informational campaigns uh, result in pretty much no behavioural change. Um, there might be a very, very slight behavioural change um, in those already considering um, engaging in that behavior. So if we think of smoking um, or reducing drinking, we do see some minor changes, but we don't tend to see children who are planning on eating less chocolate. Uh, children don't frequently plan uh, to eat less, um, le you know, fewer uh, packets of crisps. So we don't tend to have those children on that precipice that just need that slight uh, bit of information to push them over the edge um, into, into changing their eating habits for the better. We do see that some schools um, in the UK and around Europe do provide uh, healthy food at a reduced cost, uh, but simply having this food available as whole pieces of fruit, for example, uh, is not linked to increased in fruit consumption. This has been associated with um, embarrassment um, as eating whole pieces of fruit, such as an apple uh, or a banana, can be difficult for younger children and even younger adolescents to quite literally physically get their mouth around um, and um, they feel a bit undignified uh, eating it. Um, so we do see that actually if the fruit is chopped up prior to serving, we do see a higher um, uptake um, and consumption of fruit and vegetables, uh, but that isn't typically what happens. Typically we have a fruit bowl uh, at the end of the canteen line. Uh, so these methods, uh, they have been found to be unsuccessful or with very limited success. Um, however, multi-component interventions, which do indicate some great success, and there are some fantastic uh, examples from around the world, uh, they are expensive to implement uh, and maintain, um, and therefore they're not regularly funded by councils. So choice architecture and behavioural nudge interventions uh, could be uh, a cheap method of yielding positive behaviour change. Um, so in a paper um, of mine, um, using nudges to promote healthy food choice in the school dining room, a systematic review of previous investigations, we considered what works well um, in, um, in behavioural nudges, what, what we see as uh, being benefits, um, and uh, we also identified what doesn't work well. Um, and I'm going to try and focus on what doesn't work well because we've had a couple of speakers already cover the, the sort of heavily uh, supported um, nudges that, that do tend to promote healthy eating. Um, so let's have a look at what, what doesn't necessarily. So in this um, uh, systematic review, um, we searched for school canteens, school cafeterias, school eating environments and dining. And we looked at nudge and choice architecture interventions, um, environmental interventions, changing environmental variables to improve healthy eating, fruit and vegetable consumption and healthier choices. Uh, we also searched the Cornell Food Lab for published um, and unpublished literature. Um, this was prior to the Cornell Food Lab uh, retraction of quite a lot of their papers. Um, so they were included in this uh, in this paper. Uh, we also used snowballing techniques uh, to gain more um, to gain more literature um, and used uh, mixed search methodology uh, in order to gain as many papers as possible in the systematic review. Ultimately, we ended up with twenty five papers that fit our criteria. 
uh, which were to um, have simple intervention, focusing on healthy food, conducting in school cafeterias at lunchtime, reporting at least one outcome measure in food selection or consumption, um, with some sort of experimental control published since 2000. Um, exclusion criteria, and this is very important with nudges, um, it shouldn't be to reduce choice. Uh, it's not a successful nudge intervention if you take away the option of unhealthy foods, uh, because ultimately, of course, they're going to select healthy foods um, if there are no unhealthy foods available. Um, so we do still want to promote that choice. We want the individual to be um, knowing that they are making that choice um, and that it's not a case of just taking away any of the choices that we, we don't want them to make. So um, we rated studies using a quality assessment tool um, graded um, on weak, moderate to strong, assessing selection bias, study design, confounders, blinding, data collection, um, and withdrawals and dropouts, and we calculated a global score. Unfortunately, we found that the vast majority of the, um, of the interventions that we reviewed uh, did not yield a high score. So the majority of the interventions at the time were quite poor. Um, now, again, uh, I'm gonna go very briefly over what we found was successful. Um, making choosing unhealthy foods more effortful, so including the, uh, improving the accessibility of healthier foods and reducing the accessibility of unhealthy foods, but not reducing them entirely. Displaying attractive posters and videos promoting target food selection. Um, so we saw in, um, in the introduction um, about having a, a hero, a heroic feel uh, to foods and having um, influencers um, and these role models, and we do find those we do find those to be very uh, effective. Um, prompting children in the dinner queue to select healthier options, uh, and pre-ordering meals before joining the dinner queue. Um, but this is only selection of um, of healthy food items. This isn't actually consumption, and this is one of the big issues in reviewing um, nudge interventions, and indeed, actually, pretty much any healthy eating intervention in fast-paced environments, uh, they based their uh, results on selection data a lot of the time, um, so point of sale, um, which means that, yes, we do know if children are purchasing healthy items, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're eating them. Um, and indeed, if you do look at the, uh, the studies that measure both selection and consumption, uh, we do see um, a big drop-off in um, um, in significance rates uh, once we actually figure out if the child has eaten the food, uh, which is obviously what we're, what we're here to promote. Uh, actual consumption be, can be increased by changing the order of serving, uh, so serving the healthier food at the beginning uh, of, the, um, of the canteen, uh, increasing the convenience, attractiveness and normativeness of selecting healthy options, as we've covered already uh, in this e-dialogue, um, and renaming target healthy food for more um, exciting, uh, motivating names. Um, only one intervention at the time has been conducted in the UK, and this was to increase white milk consumption. As I said, uh, authors typically judge the effectiveness of the intervention based on selection data and not consumption data. Only two studies had employed actual um, visual estimation methods uh, rather than self-reported uh, feedback. Uh, so the, and the validation procedure for those methods was a little bit questionable. Um, and there was no reported, uh, no data reported on um, individual co uh, consumption. Um, so it was by cohort, uh, by sample, um, and you couldn't individualize data. Um, now from earlier when we were considering um, the impact of um, menus um, and having a healthier menu and an unhealthy menu um, and not being able to, um, to split those uh, age groups to see um, who is selecting food off the specifically healthy menu um, and who doesn't unless it's already on the, the typical menu that everyone, um, everyone reads. Um, if we individualize data, um, then we can see um, uh, if we 
um, splits grouped by age, then we can actually see which age groups are selecting um, which food items, consuming which food items. So not only can we see um, differences between age groups, we can also see um, what specifically different age groups are motivated by, which again in this panel of exploring adolescent eating behaviour um, is really important to, to understand. Um, and finally, for um, this systematic review, no one had pre-registered their interventions. Um, so we're now moving closer to pre-registering, um, everyone pre-registering interventions. At the time, none of those had been pre-registered. Now, this study was published, um, well, the, the study that I was talking about previously, uh, the systematic review, that was published in uh, 2019. And I have some recently published updates as well from um, other researchers. So this um, systematic review of systematic reviews um, about what dietary, uh, what dietary interventions are successful in secondary school environments. This was published uh, last year in 2022. Um, a number of key characteristics were found to be um, to promote um, healthier food choices. Again, we see choices, not um, actual consumption. Um, these included environmental restructuring, um, an increase in the availability of healthy foods and the use of behavioural theory. This review didn't specify that it was just looking at behavioural nudge theory. Um, and so, but we do find that what does contribute uh, to improvement in food choices is still behavioural nudging. Um, so we can be quite confident that even when compared to other uh, more multi-component interventions, that it is still the nudges that are um, of most um, efficacy. However, again, an increase in fruit or vegetable consumption um, could not be determined because there was no individualised data um, and there was also um, no actual consumption data. It was largely uh, point of sale selection data. Now, um, moving on to the last um, study that I'm going to reference in this particular area. Um, I had a look at the qualitative research and what is found to be acceptable um, in secondary school. So we've seen what's been efficient according to our quantitative data. Um, but today we're also considering the opinions um, of adolescents rather than simply studying them. We are working with them. And which is again really important because um, I don't know how far away everyone else feels from being an adolescent, but it feels a long way away, a long time ago for me. And um, I don't, I don't remember what the motivations were, and they've probably changed with um, the influence of social media and uh, and uh, the mass-produced media. And um, so this study um, explored the perspectives of um, adolescents on um, healthy uh, eating. Um, nudges, so healthy eating choice architecture. They found through qualitative analysis that the most acceptable uh, choice architecture strategies were those that um, improve the accessibility, again, um, of healthy, um, healthy items um, and those that increase the choice, um, so more options of healthy eating, so rather than simply uh, a portion of broccoli, um, having different um, healthy food items that they could choose from. Um, having more choice led to students feeling like they had more autonomy um, over their, of their food consumption. The types of messaging that particularly motivated adolescents um, were messages that highlight how healthy choices support attention, motivation and learning, uh, particularly in schools, um, and marketing strategies, uh, marketing strategies uh, that were focused on um, cost effectiveness. Um, so where healthier food items were available in larger amounts for a lower price. Now, again, we've touched upon how that isn't actually particularly feasible a lot of the time um, because unhealthy items are much more expensive than healthier items. Um, so if students were able to um, have access to cheaper, healthy options, then they will be far more likely to actually select them. Um, now, this issue was also highlighted by the catering teams who were also interviewed in this study. 
um, and they suggested that this approach would actually be a challenge to implement uh, because of with increased variety available, uh, we also have increased food waste, uh, which has a massive impact on the financial viability, which is, of course, very important to catering businesses. Um, so we've got to consider their opinions and the viability of these interventions for the caterers as well. Um, just one last thing, um, the um, nudges that have been found to be um, effective in UK dining schools. Um, this is from a paper of mine from a couple of years ago, um, where we piloted a behavioural nudge and choice architecture intervention um, targeting uh, increases in children's consumption of fruit and vegetables. Um, it does say just fruits there. We did explore fruit and vegetables, but we didn't find an um, increase in vegetable consumption. Um, we changed the food environment to include um, exciting adverts, uh, attractive names, uh, food spikes, um, advertising what specific food items were available um, actually in the food bowls, um, and uh, attracting serve, attractive serving sizes. So slicing fruit so that they are um, bite-sized chunks is important for when you're considering um, how a teenage girl doesn't necessarily want to be seen desperately trying to bite around a, a large apple. It's not particularly the most flattering um, of, of appearances. And that is what we what we see is important for, for adolescents is not wanting to look socially awkward. Um, displaying fruit and vegetables on attractive stands and distributing them in small colourful bowls. So making it look like um, a very aesthetic thing for them to be eating rather than just a lump of apple. Um, and of course, fruit and veg were served first at the beginning of the lunch queue so that their plates were full of fruit and vegetables before they got to the more starchy items and uh, the puddings. Um, one of the things that we noted uh, was particularly um, useful in individualising our data. We could see that at baseline for the intervention school, quite a few uh, children actually ate no uh, fruit or vegetable at all. Um, and this massively decreased at follow-up. So there were more children eating uh, fruit and vegetables at follow-up. Um, and this is, again, the only way we can do this is by individualising the data. So for this, we can see that this intervention was particularly um, effective for those children who ate no fruit or vegetables at all. Um, so that was um, a really big um, strength of this, of this study in behavioural nudge research. Um, we saw a significant increase in fruit uh, consumption at the intervention school compared to baseline. Um, and we concluded that ultimately with low cost behavioural nudge interventions, we can increase fruit consumption, which has a knock on effect for fibre and vitamin C. Because of the low cost of it, there is potential for national level rollouts. Um, and this was the first to uh, study to deliver behavioural nudge intervention in UK primary schools, assessing um, consumption using validated protocol, assessing effectiveness to a micro or macronutrient level and individualising the data. The limitation was, as I, as I mentioned at the outset, we didn't see an increase in vegetable consumption. Uh, vegetables are quite a bit more difficult to target in this sample um, as they're not um, you know, sweet and, and tasty um, and, uh, and delicious as you know, sweets are uh, to, to adolescents. We need more intensive, perhaps multi-component interventions to be successful um, to improve the intrinsic value um, of these items to, um, to children and adolescents. Um, so, yeah, so that's all from me. Um, I hope that that was um, interesting uh, and informative. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Olivia. It was uh, interesting to note. And then I just realized as you were presenting this, there are hardly any studies in Indian context uh, which have even experimented this kind of things to our knowledge. Perhaps mm -hmm. there are, but to our knowledge, there are none. Uh, when we look for it. And then um, uh, it's interesting to see these. And then uh, I'm afraid there are no questions at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, there are any questions from the panelists or co-panelists, uh, I can allow one or two, please. Quick questions. Uh, sir, I had one question. Yes, Pradeep. Um, Ma'am, uh, you were talking about renaming uh, healthy target food. 
so in uh, what respect would you like to rename it uh, completely change the name of the dish or adding any new words to it um so what we what we found um was adding more exciting descriptors um, it tends to be associated with the uh, potential nutritional outcome um, of the food. So um, like using words like energizing um, and, um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't remember uh, particularly many, but, um, but advertising the food with uh, more exciting descriptive names added um, to the name of the food. So we didn't. We didn't rename uh, the foods entirely. We, uh, it was still very clear to uh, the participants what the food items were, um, because of course, behavioural nudge theory isn't about um, manipulating people into not actually knowing what they're eating. Uh, it's hoping that they know what they're eating um, and choosing it anyway. Um, so it was um, more um, exciting and, and descriptive rather than changing it so that it was a bit more uh, ambiguous. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a uh, question in the box, but um, uh, I don't know how very relevant it is to your presentation, but I can ask you and also Junofi to see if you can uh, take this question. Uh, the, the question is, I'm from India and I'm watching uh, so many interventions for healthy eating. The question is why health practitioners are not directing their uh, whatever. I mean, I, that's what I understand. Directing their messages to children, parents, and teachers. Why there are no healthy eating periods in school and healthy eating discussions with the uh, healthy eating week with the parents and teachers? Will that uh, in any way improve uh, healthy eating? Is what uh, she asks. If I if I put the question right. So, um, so what we find um, is that uh, it is possible. Uh, those do tend to be down to the uh, to the individual schools. Um, and again, we see issues with uh, things like catering. Um, caterers um, are generally in the UK and America um, independent businesses um, that the school hire to provide um, their um, food at lunchtime. Um, and because of that, they, they you know, want to maximise profits and minimise waste. Um, and if they commit to uh, these super healthy eating programmes, um, they might expect to see, at least initially, um, a dip in, um, in profits because children aren't rushing to get their chips or their, um, or their cake at lunchtime. Um, and so that is a, a barrier um, to... Uh, to healthy eating in schools um, needing to get the caterers on board. Um, another issue um, with directing these messages um, at parents or teachers um, is that ultimately we want the children's opinion to change. We want them to make that decision because behaviour isn't going to be maintained over time if um, it is enforced by parents or teachers. Um, it's, um, you know, that's um, the motivation is you're told what to do, and so therefore you do it in order to be well behaved, um, rather than you have a choice of uh, healthy or unhealthy, and you choose healthy because you know of the intrinsic benefits of that. Um, so ultimately, um, whilst parents and teachers do um, give these messages to their children a lot of the time, interventions are directed at the children because it's only in the maintenance of healthy behavior that we can expect to see actual health outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. I had one question. In all these interventions that target were children, and then at any point of time, did you come across any of the children thinking that their food architecture or their food choice or the food uh, uh, you know, options that are being provided to them are being imposed on them? Did you ever come across such a, a feeling among your respondents or participants? Um, we, um, in my research, um, no, we haven't found that um, because uh, one of the things that we, um, I mean, generally in behavioral nudge research, um, but, but certainly uh, in my own, um, I um, always make sure that the choices aren't reduced. 
Um, so if the children were always offered a uh, chocolate cake on a Thursday, that chocolate cake on a Thursday is still there. It's just a bit more, it's perhaps um, in, on a shelf behind the dinner queue, so they have to ask the caterer to, uh, to go and fetch it for them rather than being there and easily accessible to grab. Um, so we are making the choices more difficult. This is what um, choice architecture is, but we're not removing those choices entirely. Otherwise, again, we're not promoting uh, consistent and maintained change. Um, we're just promoting um, them choosing healthy things when it's the only option. Um, so thus far, um, I've not experienced any pushback in that regard. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the panel discussion now. I request my colleagues to introduce all the panelists at one go, and then uh, I will moderate the panel discussion. Good evening. Uh, so now we will move towards the panel discussion today. I am Paramita Banerjee, uh, project coordinator of the LFOF initiative. Uh, so today's uh, uh, panel has uh, mem experts from various perspectives. Uh, like a chef, a uh, uh, hotelier, and most important, uh, startup, uh, healthy food startup, and most importantly, an adolescent youth leader who will be sharing their views. Let me uh, share my slides to introduce our panelists. Uh, so, our first panelist is, doc uh, is Mr. Akshay Nilakantam. Uh, he is the representative from Federation of Hotel and Restaurant Association of India. Mr. Akshay has completed his Master's in Business Administration from the Amity Business School, Delhi. He holds the title of Mr. India 2017. He's passionate about fitness and runs a fitness training firm. He currently owns a hotel in Hyderabad and will be sharing his practical experiences and solutions that can be integrated into restaurant food environment to make, uh, to make food eating out healthy. The next panelist is Mr. Inam Khan. He is a chef from Hyderabad. He is a culinary connoisseur with a degree in culinary arts and certification in food safety management from the Boston uh, University, Massachusetts. He is the first Indian chef to be featured on Fox News and National Public Radio. Chef Inam has contributed his professional skills while working with the fitness coaches and dietitians of several Bollywood, Tollywood, and uh, Hollywood stars. He runs a successful restaurant in Hyderabad where he focuses that food is, should be always to create menus which are not just great in taste, but also nutritiously balanced. Our third panelist is Mr. Priyank Jain, who is a co-founder of a healthy food startup. He holds an MBA degree from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, Delhi. He has represented India in prestigious CFA research challenge at Asia Pacific level in Sydney, Australia. He has been a core team member for the entrepreneurship cell promoted by the DST government of India. He is the co-founder of, of the first healthy soup-based meal brand to help people transition seamlessly towards a healthier lifestyle. And our last panelist is Mr. Uh, Pratik Vaidya, who is a student of VBS Sardar Patel School of Bangalore. He uh, hails from, uh, he has been a meritorious student and has secured fifth rank in the state level uh, 10th board exam. He has actively participated and won several quizzes, essay competitions on societal issues. He is fond of doodling and cardistry. Being a health en enthusiast, he abstains from eating out and also encourages his friends to do so. I now request Dr. Subarao to moderate the panel uh, discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Paravita, for the quick introduction. And we have um, a lovely panel and um, people from very diverse backgrounds, uh, you know, who have interests both in fitness as well as uh, ensuring healthy food is meted out to uh, people out there. And uh, uh, before we go in, I think uh, I would actually change the order of the panel and ask the first question to the adolescent and then get to the other panelists uh, with uh, the takeaways from there. Pratik, uh, tell me frankly, how often do you go out to eat and how often do you indulge yourself in uh, eating foods that are not so healthy, knowing that they are not very healthy? Yes, sir. Um, as it was mentioned earlier in my bio, um, I don't go out often to eat out in malls or restaurants. 
maybe twice or thrice um, if my friends um, ask me to come otherwise not um, so often so oh, fantastic and what kind of options uh, do you like to have if you want to go out in terms of healthy foods so it again depends upon the group i am going out with if i'm going out, uh, out with my friends i would go with western food burgers pizzas if i'm going out with my family it's uh, the north indian uh, basically indian children yeah that's that very clearly shows the peer pressure and also the appeal that the foods have for uh, youngsters now i'll move on to uh, mr akshay uh, this is very very important to know um, uh, you know uh, how restaurants are uh, really uh, gearing themselves up to give um, provide healthy options or is it actually there on their agenda or not to provide healthy food options to uh, because uh, it's often seen uh, from academics or from the policy makers or from the regulators perspective the industry or the restaurants and they they'll be seen only as profit making machines and then they not bothered so much about healthy food options but now we see number of them coming up uh, and obviously i mean um, uh, from our knowledge we see that the healthier options are way very expensive than the uh, way expensive than the uh, normal foods so is there any push from within the hotelier group to actually go and uh, make these choices healthy uh, can we have your perspective so the thing is when it comes to healthy food am i audible right now uh, yes yeah. you are so yeah uh, so i don't know i was uh, asked to uh, present i mean prepare a presentation on all but i don't believe in presentations i'm a little old school uh, so yeah uh, when it comes to healthy foods i'll, I'll actually put them in uh, two different sectors i'll give you the business front as well as the health front on it okay so now when it comes to the business front okay uh, what i'm trying to say right now is that uh, you can have a business on healthy foods and you can gimmick okay you can gimmick any food to be a healthy food but it will not be a sustainable business okay this is very clear okay and healthy food need not be expensive that is that is that is the bottom line and uh, if you if you want your food to reach your client okay because i have my clients and if and forget consumers point of view i have my clients who train in fitness okay they're looking at healthy uh, healthy foods if you want them to reach to their goals and you want the food to be healthy it need not be expensive it has to just meet their goals and the food can be plain simple as rice and chicken also and uh, what i'm trying what i'm saying even chef is going to agree uh, with me if you need a sustainable business and healthy foods okay you don't have to gimmick anything you just have to fulfill that nutritional requirement of the clients that's that's it it's it's plain old plain simple simple one sentence fulfill the nutritional requirement fulfill the nutritional goals and then you will have a sustainable business because those those people will keep coming back to you to complete their fitness goals when it comes to the food aspect now two things what people forget is one is they look at diet and they look at workout on a different platform they think 30% is workout and 70% diet and 60 40 and all that no it doesn't work that way okay i'm talking about purely the workout uh, perspective okay so working out is just stimulating your body okay this is a stimulus there has to be an adaptation to it okay so when you work out working out doesn't grow your muscles what you do after that those 22 hours 21 hours is what makes you grow your muscles or lose your fat so there has to be a stimulus there has to be an adaptation if you just go and work out and you don't diet it's not going to work if you just go to diet and you're not going to work out it's not going to work i myself have my cousins and my family members who you know the question saying that no we can just diet and we can just get get fit and get thin and all it's not going to work that way now making money i as a businessman i know that a sustainable business makes more money than a short term business that's basic that's basic mathematics sixth class mathematics ground rule that's okay now coming to the whole uh, fitness perspective okay when it comes to healthy foods uh, there is a uh, plain conception in the in uh, in our daily household or in daily in everyone's place that you know home food is healthy true okay okay home food need not necessarily be healthy okay this is a very plain ground rule okay and you ordering from outside saying Sw- swiggy or zomato or something i am a swiggy customer every single day okay i call for swiggy every single day swiggy need not be unhealthy what you order from swiggy determines if you want to eat healthy food or not healthy food okay 
as long as it fulfills your fitness goals, it fulfills your nutritional requirement, it completes your healthy aspect. And what is healthy food? Whole foods are always healthy. A meal has to be complete. It has to have your proteins, it has to have your carbs, it has to have your fats. As long as these three, these three things are in place, I think you're good to go. And there was one question which was asked by uh, in the chat box saying that why aren't the teachers and the parents and the, uh, you know these people aren't questioned on these things. You know, what I firmly believe is that what the parents preach and what they follow, the children actually follow that. Okay. Now, if you as a parent are being unhealthy, if you as a parent are developing uh, habits which are not healthy, which are, you know, showcasing things such as, you know, you're eating pizzas and burgers and, and whatnot, and then you are expecting your children to, to, you know, stick to home food and stick to a, uh, what do you call, just rice and, you know, stick to good food, they're not going to do that. You being lazy is not going to make them be not lazy. Okay. And uh, a very big misconception that uh, goes ahead into this field is that, you know, uh, I've seen it personally, like you can have pizza, burgers and everything and it's all good. But the moment you pick up a protein shake, everyone becomes a doctor around you. Okay. Uh, the question saying why are you having protein shake? Why are you having so much of chicken? Why are you having boiled chicken? Why are you having vegetables and all? So there has to be a balance. I'm not saying protein shakes are the only way to be healthy. Protein shakes are nothing but supplements. It's just supplement. The word supplement means it adds to your plan. It is not a substitute. It's not a replace, replacement. Okay. So these things are something which people need to understand on a whole holistic uh, point of view and then move ahead. Now, if you don't follow healthy food habits at home, then it's very difficult that your kids cultivate those habits and the youth actually follows those habits. So this is my perspective when it comes to healthy food on business aspect as well as the personal aspect. True, thank you. I'll uh, get back to you with, uh, uh, you know, more of a business question later. Uh, now, uh, my question is to Mr. Priyank. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there is this question that has been raised that, uh, uh, you know, it's not really making food look healthy, but it's all about meeting the nutritional goal. That's what Mr. Akshay said. So you run a startup uh, which deals with healthy foods and why uh, you thought of this and then is uh, who are your takers? I mean, are there any youngsters who are your takers and then what, have, what has been your, uh, uh, you know, idea in terms of uh, changing the choice architecture? Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir, for that question. So I run a brand called Supex, which is a healthy soup-based meal brand, healthy soup and healthy soup-based meal brand, uh, which runs out of Delhi NCR at the moment. And the motivation behind it was very simple. When back in COVID, this was born after COVID, and we realized that people are looking to change their dietary lifestyles. People are conscious about what they were eating. There was mindful eating that was in play, but there was there were lack of brands which were operating which were catering to that healthy food segment. That was number one. Number two, uh, we realized that soup, which is in itself such a healthy product, but there was no brand for healthy soups in the country where people could order ready to eat healthy soups and the sides supplementing the soups. And number three, the dietary lifestyles, the people were looking at existing brands in the country, which were uh, helping people seamlessly transition to their dietary lifestyles. It was very expensive on the pockets. So these were the three challenges that we, the problems that we identified, which helped us build the brand Supex from the start. And to we have around 99 plus varieties of healthy soups, which are catering different health types, and they are targeted towards different set of customers, and they are fresh without adding any artificial preservative. So that's the purpose of building this brand. And the particular takers, what we have realized is... I mean, although we did not get data of the health of the age-wise categorization from Swiggy, Zomatos, and the marketplaces where we enlisted, but most of our customers who repeat, who take repeat orders from us are generally within the range of up, above 30 years. And that's where we realized that adolescents are the players which are not really, you know, excited towards healthy food as an alternative. And that's where we tried some of the nudges that effectively helped us, you know, build that brand and also reach out to adolescents to a great extent, which I could cover in the subsequent questions as well. But to your question, the primary takers of the healthy food, what we realized as a business was pe were people who were relatively on the higher side of the age, 30 plus. Yeah, could you also tell us a bit about uh, the nudges that you use to get adolescents for healthy food options? Yeah. 
So one of the, some of the few nudges that we initially experimented with and found really effective to be reaching out to adolescents. Number one, we made a conscious choice to you know, balance the healthy and the healthier. So for example, when we launched sandwiches, right, along with soups, so they were all whole wheat breads, number one. Number two, what we did was there were some maida options available in some of the products. So what we did deliberately was pricing the maidas, a maida products a little higher. Although if you look across most of the restaurants, Maidas are relatively, Maida products are relatively cheaper, right? But on the other hand, what we did was whole wheat options were made a little 10 or 20 rupees cheaper and the default option was whole wheat. Now that led to, now that led us to see that people were ordering whole wheat options more. Adolescents are price sensitive as most of the panelists also mentioned. So by pricing the whole wheat little lower, we saw more acceptability for whole wheat products. And then we were also playing with these default options not just from the nutrition's point of view, but also it helped us in the business growth as well. So these were some few nudges that we helped, that helped us as a brand. Okay, fantastic. I think you touched upon the point that uh, Dr. Jonafi had made about making default options healthier. And then uh, I think, yeah, I mean, this is one one way a nudge can actually be a, you know, positive in terms of prompting a healthier option. Yeah, I think uh, I deliberately kept the chef towards the end because I'm sure he's going to dish out a better uh, and more tastier options to us. Uh, and, um, you know, this is year of millets. And then uh, we are also one of the highest producers of uh, fruit and vegetable in the world. Uh, and uh, how uh, interesting is it to use these healthier options um, in the recipes, uh, do they add that kind of a taste and do you have takers for them? How do you make them more appealing? Your mic is off. Your mic is off. And especially for younger consumers, uh, how is it done? As um, uh, Mr. Akshay already said, all that is cooked at home need not necessarily be healthy. We also believe that. It all depends on what you're using to cook them. So how, you, how do you make these uh, options healthier and more, uh, not just appetizing, but also appealing for the adolescents? Please turn on your mic. Mr. Nam, your mic is off. No. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I just wanted to let you all know, I would not be uh, presenting my views just as a, being a chef, but also being a father of uh, three beautiful children um, who, who happen to be uh, uh, coming into their uh, teens. And unfortunately, among uh, them, one is a, a slightly ADHD uh, uh, kid. So right from my uh, right from his childhood, my wife and I, like you know, we uh, uh, we uh, we were constantly involved in like you know trying out uh, new dietary meals for him to see like you know how he react like and of course uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, with the advice and suggestions uh, uh, by the by his uh, um, uh, psychiatrists and uh, uh, psychologists. Um, three incident happens which uh, really made me. Uh, uh, which really influenced me as a chef to change the whole concept of uh, food, the, the kind of food I serve in my restaurant is actually the byproduct of uh, those incidents which happen. Um, uh, one, we, uh, uh, my kids and I, like, you know, we went for a movie and during the break time, um, we uh, stepped out and uh, we went to a food counter and all I could see was like right from A to Z, nothing was healthy. You know, um, there's like a huge tub of pop popcorn we have to take uh, apparently. And that was loaded with so much of sodium, followed by like we had an option either to go for water or uh, a soft drink. Again, like, you know, loaded with uh, tons of sugars. So uh, we picked up a bottle of water, but even that tub of popcorn was like, it was so much of salt, so, so much of sodium, which is... Uh, very very unhealthy for uh, for kids like you know i was i was looking at uh, from a father's point of view at that time that incident the second one was uh, i'm sure like which this happens to uh, pretty much all of us every now and then like you know we we take our family our kids to uh, a grocery store 
um so at that time my, my wife was like you know she was picking up all the uh, healthy stuff like from the shelf like in you know, all uh, millets and uh, quinoa brown rice and all that stuff some uh, leafy vegetables and organic eggs and all as we were approaching for the billing um uh, the, the 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 sides of the billing counter was so beautifully decorated with all uh, this uh, sugar coated uh, sugar filled uh, um, uh, candies uh, uh, cookies and all that stuff and uh, my girl like you know she picked up a few of the items and she was she looked at us like you know please can i have this and we had a big queue behind us and uh, we had to say like you know, we just have to agree to her so as um, uh, as the doctor earlier said like you know the availability and the visibility it matters a lot you know and if that availability and visibility is of uh, uh, unhealthy food it uh, it gonna give a very negative impact on our kids uh, since we were we were talking about the kids that, that's the reason i want to stick to uh, 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 young children and adolescents that was the second incident and the third one was uh, just our family gathering i'm sure like you know we all go out uh, with our families for uh, to attend uh, social gatherings and uh, family gatherings so even uh, there the food which was served was uh, not at all healthy it was it was very fancy it was uh, very colorful but uh, definitely it was not healthy so i'm being a chef being a father and uh, having a special child i i'm very 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 particular about like you know what to add in my menu uh and how to play around uh, you know with uh, with the sides so for example like you know um uh, about the availability and the visibility what i have done once you enter in my restaurant the the the, the very first thing you're going to see is like there's a huge banner uh of uh, top athletes bodybuilders and uh, the movie actors action heroes like you know which i have personally catered to and i got the testimonials from them Uh, which definitely has um, one or two quotes of uh, healthy eating. Okay. So when a family enters with their children, the first thing they're gonna see is like they're gonna see one of their uh, uh, stars, one of their um, favorite athletes, with a small note, a quote which says uh, something very positive about about uh, eating healthy stuff. So once they enter, um, they open the menu. you order from a to z anything from my menu i make sure the plate what you get is consist of all the nutrients which is important for your your body your mind your muscle so for example uh, our chicken steaks are quite popular it's it's loved by both uh, children and adults the 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 plating is pretty much the same for uh, for uh, everybody so you have a piece of chicken which is your protein is accompanied with the uh, slow roasting carbs in the form of brown rice then we we give a uh, lot of fiber in the form of either grilled veggies or uh, steam veggies or some salads and then um when they're eating all this just to treat them more uh it's a reward like by putting some uh, mashed potatoes and and a corn and of course i mean the the, the sauce which goes uh, with that is also quite healthy so we have to make sure as a chef you know um uh, that whatever we serve we have to see the the, the nutritious value of uh, the uh, item the food items what we are serving and also we have to see uh, how how tasty it is and how colorful it is so it's it's all about like especially uh, young children uh, even adults we get carried away like you know looking at those uh, commercials of uh, a food item even though it's not healthy but the way they present it the way the the pictureization is done with the, so much of glamour is added to that like you know the children would get uh, dulled over that even adults like us like you know we like wow it looks so delicious and so tasty but we know what is the the nutritious value of it whether it's good for us or not yeah. so imagine the kids like you know they would just get carried away so we so, cannot put any breaks to them uh, but uh, you know from whatever from our side uh, i'm talking about me being as chef so i make sure my food looks presentable and uh, uh delicious in taste and uh, very colorful by using uh, uh vegetable extracts uh, for the colors and um, you mentioned about the millets of course like you know the, we uh, we have plenty of uh, recipes uh, uh which we use for our uh, millets which tastes good which looks colorful um uh, it just that like you know we have to learn and we have to uh, understand like how we can make it uh, make it look more appealing 
and uh, more uh, uh, tasty. And uh, it goes, we should go as, as a good accompaniment with, uh, with the main protein item. Okay. Thank you very much. This is a very insightful, you know, what uh, the uh, researchers have said from all the research you're, you're in fact trying to practice and then have shown that they do impact the way it is displayed, uh, what is displayed around, what is primed, and then the order in which the food is served. All these are very, very important. Uh, thank you very much for all three of you, uh, other than uh, Pratik. I just have one question and I request you to uh, be very short in one sentence, uh, answer these questions. One is, it is generally assumed that healthier food options are much expensive than uh, the uh, regular food or not so healthy ones. Is it true? If so, how you are overcoming in your respective dimensions? Number two is, are you also, uh, you are consciously doing uh, uh, something to improve the architecture in your own um, uh, areas, but are you also in touch with your peers and what do they say? First is first question is, are healthy foods expensive? Second question is, are your peers also thinking in the same direction? If so, we are in a in a very good uh, position. Otherwise, uh, not. Please, uh, Mr. Akshay first. Sir, so the uh, 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 sir, could you just repeat the first question? Uh, Pratik, I'll get to you later. This is only for the three of them because they are uh, they are deciding on the architecture. I'll come to the adolescent perspective a little later, Pratik. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a question you. to only the three of them, uh, Mr. Uh, Inam, Priyank, and uh, Akshay. So you, uh, the basic point was uh, that, you know, food need not be expensive on that perspective, right? Right. True. Okay. okay. So when I, I'll talk from my personal friend, okay, when I cater to my clients, okay, uh, the food that I give it to the, the, that I give to them is very basic, sir. It's very basic. It is something that you can even get it prepared at your home. Okay. okay. You need not have fancy quinoa or you not have all these things that you know you have to get it from a supermarket and it can be plain or simple plain rice okay. like i said uh when you have to meet your goals it's all about calorie in and calorie out but at the same time it need not be calorie in and calorie out also to elaborate on that so when you calculate please, calories please, brief we, we are running yeah, out of when you, yeah. yeah so when you uh come on to calories sir it's very simple that the carbs and proteins accumulate to four calories each and the fats accumulate to nine calories. A lot of people, what they do is they eat below the calorie uh, which is needed, okay? And they eat anything they want. So it doesn't suffice that way. You need to have your calories in place. At the same time, you need to have your proteins, carbs, and fats in place to achieve those results. So whatever I give my clients is basic, like white rice, you know, chicken, you know, veggies, and mashed potato, like how chef said, that's a complete meal. What he just described is a complete meal. And that's a, that's a meal you can even make it at your place. And it need not, you know, go get it from somewhere and need not be fancy, like, you know, grilled chicken and boiled this thing, boiled chicken and all these things. It doesn't have to be that fancy as long as you're competing. Okay. So that's my take on it. Right. Mr. Priyank. Uh, my take is a little different uh, because of the, uh, I'm talking from the respect to the market and with respect to the wider gamut of consumers and not specifically me. So I personally think that healthy options are not expensive, but unhealthier options are cheaper. And the reason I say so is because, you know, there are a lot of artificial substitutes which are added to the unhealthier products, but because they are widely marketed, they are widely present and visible to the most of the consumers, they feel that's the default or perhaps the average price range is similar. And then when they look at healthier food options, they find, you know, that they are expensive. For example, I just went on two visits la uh, last last week. I went to Uti, and which is the land of chocolates. Then I went to Kur, the land of coffees. In when I went to Uti, I was visiting this chocolate factory, and I saw this. Uh, I was buying the original chocolates from them. It was costing me around two fifty to two thirty. I don't remember. And apparently, the default reaction was, "Why is it so expensive?" But then I realized when I was having conversations with them, I was comparing the ingredients online with them. Then I realized that all the options available in the market are little, they have substituted the original products with something else that makes them look cheaper or affordable. So that's one of the things. The other thing is, your question is towards how do my peers react or how, how are my peers' reaction to the products? And I think particularly after when I visited this platform called Shark Tank this year, and after that, when I've been talking to my peers, I realized most of them are unaware about what the ingredients on the backside read. 
True. Certain, you know, abbreviations like fresh paneer or nutritious, etc. are being misguised and used as something which is not really the ingredient property, but is a trademark in itself. And okay. then compounded by the fact that my generation particularly, or people of my age who just embark their corporate journeys, they live on the on-the-go lifestyles and they find convenience to be more, you know, uh, at a more uh, at a factor that they value more. So I think these coupled with busy schedules are not the reason why they are preferring healthy choices, perhaps. Thank you. Chef? Um, I agree with Akshay, like uh, the um, um, healthy food need not to be uh, expensive. Um, and it also depends from person to person the, uh, the, the kind of uh, nutritious requirement they have. Um, and also, like, you know, if we know, if we have decent knowledge uh, on the nutritious values of, like, you know, different uh, ingredients, uh, we can always play around with uh, substituting uh, the expensive one with the, the, with the reasonable one. Um, and then later on, like, you know, it becomes a, uh, 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 a chef's skills. Like, you know, uh, I'm talking about, like, you know, from my perspective. Uh, we have, uh, I have uh, clients, like, you know, who, uh, uh, who request for uh, something, um, something different and uh, they want they want to have um, like quinoa a uh, little fancy stuff you know so you have to abide by their uh, request as well however we also get uh, clients like you know who are uh, who just uh, like you know tell me directly uh, this is the budget and uh, this is how this is what i i needed this is the um, uh, this, is, this is the nutrition i'm looking for so you as a chef like you know you have to sit down and like you know you have to work on the pricing and uh, the, 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 you take out the nutritious values and balance it out in such a fashion that it fulfills their requirement and at the same time it um, uh, it matches to their uh, pockets okay thank you very much now i want uh, prateek to come on and then please tell us as a youngster you know your choices are made generally limited by lot of interest. There are businesses, there are hotels who want to sell and then make money, but there are also the conscious ones like the panelists we have today who really want to dish out the best ones to you. As a youngster, what are your suggestions to the people to give you healthier food options? And what are your suggestions to your own friends uh, to choose healthy food options? Okay, sir. Uh, firstly, um, my suggestion to the hotel industry would be uh, to replace the posters of junk food which mainly attracts the teenagers with the more healthier food, like a, a double Whopper burger with a smaller one, which is much healthier and less fat concentrated. And uh, one more thing would be substituting sodas with fresh juice, like an indirect uh, intake of uh, fruits also happens through that form. Um, roasted food instead of uh, fried food, uh, like having a health conscious idea here. Um, and the second suggestion, which is not a viable option, but a possible thing is uh, to create separate menus for different age groups. That would be one thing. Um, and uh, we can accordingly choose based on those menus. Um, and uh, third uh, suggestion would be uh, to provide the, uh, which is earlier mentioned by many of the panelists, is to provide healthy food at discounted rates for uh, adolescents, which is more attractive. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Those are very nice key takeaways that uh, you have given. And uh, I have a question in the Q&A box which says, um, it's a very basic question in a country like India where we uh, not just look at obesity but also malnutrition. That I'm, I'm sure they're talking about undernutrition. is a significant challenge. The question is, can nudging work uh, to address both the issues simultaneously or we need more basic level behavior intervention? I think I'll answer this question uh, from LFOF perspective. The LFOF is dedicated at combating uh, obesity and overweight among adolescents and then seeing this as an option. But nevertheless, choice architecture, if you go to the villages, if you go to rural areas, if you go to low income uh, you know, slums and things like that, the, uh, the, the options that are available to you otherwise are very uh, available at a very cheaper price, like a two rupee chips pack or a two rupee biscuit pack, they're custom made. So the default option that is available for even uh, the economically deprived is the unhealthy option. So if the choice architecture, as, as Priyank already said, it is not that the healthier foods are expensive. The unhealthier ones are made to look cheaper. So 
that definitely is uh, one of the uh, you know options that everyone uh, you know uh, exercises so changing the food architecture is a need of the hour and uh, changing the uh, architecture involves making foods available accessible affordable uh, and also very tasty and then appealing all these things it works on both the ends definitely i am not sure how much research is there in terms of prompting under nutrition but healthier food options will be good for not just combating overweight and obesity but also to combat the other spectrum of uh, malnutrition that is under nutrition i hope i answered your question uh, one thing that i would do is there is one one um, attendee who has been raising and continuously i'll just uh, allow her to speak uh, yashashwini if you can please speak because i don't know who you are but you've been raising your hand to speak what's your question can you just uh, pose it very quickly to our panelists and uh, uh, then we will wrap up please can you ask your question yashashwini okay fine i think uh, yeah are you asking a question yes right uh, i think uh, uh, it's not happening so i'll come to the last part of this uh, very interesting e dialogue we had a different perspective today uh, of course some of the issues have already been spoken about uh, but at the end of each e dialogue we have five key takeaways that we uh, always Uh, talk about for me there are five key takeaways the first and foremost is for the researchers the researchers takeaway is that there is hardly any research in indian context as to how nudges and choice architecture is impacting the food choices of the adolescents i think that's the need of the r we as researchers need to take it up very seriously but there are no uh, uh, doubts about how choice architecture um, impacts uh, people's food choices more so of the adolescents so as pratik said uh, can we look at uh, an option of making healthier food options exclusively for the adolescent age groups especially in uh, you know restaurants and uh, and uh, other places that they usually uh, frequent that's one question that we need to debate and if so how we do it uh, is one uh, thing that we have to discuss and it should also include the school canteens and also uh, at homes how the default options are made available for uh, the kids and uh, uh, the third most important thing is the visual hierarchy definitely has an impact on choice of the foods can there be a policy to ensure that the healthier food options are displayed more prominently and more appealingly so that uh, the choices can be prompted uh, 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 you know towards the healthier options and uh, most importantly from the research that we have seen especially for adolescents if healthier eating is linked to learning healthier eating is linked to health outcomes healthier eating is linked to looking uh, good better or healthy i think there is definitely uh, 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 you know a, a, an option of uh, choosing them so is that possible uh, that is the fourth key takeaway take away and fifth and the fourth foremost is that the choice architecture should start changing at home level at home whatever is made is not necessarily healthy but we should know what uh, is healthy for us and then that choice happens at home level i think the demand for that uh, if the default option is healthier option at home i am sure the demand for healthier option will also be exercised by adolescents wherever they go and uh, that's it and these are my five key takeaways and then i get another question uh, why the government health practitioners or anganwadi workers not educating about healthy eating or locally available i am sorry i mean we can't assume the anganwadi workers have been the uh, the the backbone of our system and then they have been doing tremendous work there are exemplar anganwadi workers who are trying to uh, uh, provide nutrition information if they are not doing it perhaps uh, uh, in some cases Uh, it is not always uh, of lack of knowledge and sometimes it is also because of the heavy burden of work that they have got that they don't get adequate time to uh, focus on uh, education alone because there are so many tasks on them thank you all thank you very much
uh, Dr. Bhanu has also joined and then uh, thank you for being with us for so long and uh, the very good panelists and the excellent speakers that we've had today have really made this uh, e-dialogue an interesting one. And I thank each one of you, uh, uh, Dr. Olivier and uh, Dr. Junofi and uh, Mr. Inam, Mr. Priyank and Rakshay and most importantly, uh, Vineet and uh, uh, my uh, very lovely and friendly team that I have got. Uh, of all the uh, you know young ladies and young men who toil uh, for months to put together uh, such very good programs, uh, credit to them. And then I'm only the front face of the uh, entire uh, endeavor. And my special thanks to UNICEF India and all the consortium partners, PHFI, World Food Program, WHO and others. Special thanks to our director, Dr. Himrata for uh, encouraging and many, many thanks again to Dr. Bhanu for taking time out. I know he's been in and out of several meetings in the last one hour also, but still he's made it uh, possible to come back and then stay with us and then be part of this. And uh, thank you all, thank you very much. And many thanks to our general club uh, secretaries for popularizing this and my IT team and uh, our uh, uh, you know software engineers who've made everything uh, possible for us. Thank you all, thank you very much. And I hope uh, the key takeaways uh, will be worked on. We are sure to come up with some policy recommendations and then we'll incorporate these. Thank you, uh, especially Pratik, uh, for staying with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.